Well, now there is a lot of information out there on uh, COVID. So starting from the global medical organizations like uh, CDC and the World Health Organization to our governmental organizations, starting from obviously the Ministry of Health website. Then there is a lot of information on the individual state Ministry of Health websites. Then you have all kinds of medical literature now available to even lay people out there. There is scientific literature and then there is medical literature which is not so scientific out there. So in midst of uh, all this, it is sometimes difficult to make out what is true, what is false, how far we should believe, what lit. In this regard, what I thought was in the next maybe five to six minutes, I wish to put forward uh, my perspectives on uh, two or three important aspects of the COVID as an illness. Now, I am fully aware that uh, these perspectives may turn out to be totally wrong in the future. After all, the World Health Organization got it wrong the right at the first time uh, when it identified this initially in China. So, obviously, this being a new disease, none of us have, can claim to have absolute knowledge and be certain of the different uh, uh, what you call proposals or presumptions we make about the disease and its management. But what I see around nowadays is a lot of uh, paranoid response with uh, which I believe is a bit because of lesser understanding of the transmission and the, about the overall infectious diseases management and uh, the spread of the disease. And uh, I thought I would like to again put forward two or three observations from my side regarding this aspect. So to start with, the first point which I would like to address is about the transmission of the COVID illness or the Corona 2 virus. Now, if we look at the well-established guidelines on this, be it the World Health Organization, be it the CDC or be it the Ministry of Health website, so they go on to say that this is primarily a droplet-borne respiratory virus, meaning it spreads close distance with large droplets which come out of your mouth or nose when you cough or sneeze or even sometimes talk and a bit of contact bond transmission meaning these droplets fall onto the surfaces around and then people touch those surfaces and they, then they touch themselves and then hence they can acquire the virus. There is also an element of airborne transmission here. So there, though uh, whether an airborne transmission plays an important role in the normal interactions of people in public vis-a-vis -vis when specific procedures are done in a healthcare setting or a hospital, like inserting a tube into the throat, etc., which could produce a lot of aerosols out. So aerosols are smaller particles which travel long distances and hence people need not be close together to acquire the disease. And the aerosols also apparently stay or float in the air for a longer time. So even when people come back or get into the room after some time, after the patient has gone, they are still likely to acquire this. So basically what I am summarizing is that we know for a certain that droplet bond and to some bit contact bond transmission from the environment, immediate environment of the ill patient could be there. There is also presumption that a bit of airborne component is there with particular procedures, risk-based procedures, which mostly happens in healthcare setting, but also it could happen in public spheres like when there is group singing in, uh, in certain uh, places or etc. So this is sometimes possible in the public also. So, so now, uh, but if you look at the measures targeted, there is a lot of paranoia regard on disinfection of what we call as fomites, right? So fomites are either your immediate built environment like your floors, wall, tables, etc., or it could be equipments and items like your mobiles and your shoes or your clothes, etc. Now, so here is where we have to make a differentiation between the precautions taken based on the knowledge we have and precautions based on the fear of what could happen. Okay. Now, if uh, we have more than hundreds of clusters of infections reported all around the world, so what do I mean by clusters? What I mean is that we know for certain that a group of people have been affected from a certain area from one or two deceased people who were there in that crowd or in that unit at that time. Okay. So these provides us insights into how this disease could spread. So throughout the literature available, the published literature available, so the, when you read through it, it shows that there are certain risk factors associated how this transmission has occurred. So in most of these situations, the transmission has occurred in closed, 
spaces, closed, enclosed spaces, meaning in so rooms or halls, etc., not in the open, outer, uh, outdoor sort of situation. Most of these transmissions have occurred when there were crowds or lots of people in that closed environment. There has been opportunity for prolonged contact. So by prolonged contact is 10 minutes or 15 minutes or beyond. So it's not that somebody just walked into a room and walked out and he got the disease. It, the people stayed there for a significant amount of time and then they had the opportunity to get infected. In the healthcare settings, the risk was noted with particular procedures which are known as aerosol generating procedures and with inappropriate use of personal protective equipment, that is your use of mask and gloves and eye protection, etc. So what we understand about transmission from the more than a lack of cases which has been you know, studied and published in various medical literature is that mostly you require an indoor closed ventilation sort of setting and you require contact for some amount of time and certain high risk procedures in hospitals will place you at a higher risk and if you are not wearing appropriate personal protective equipment in relation to the outside scene or the risk then you could be at a higher risk. So there is absolutely not much of evidence out there to implicate fomites as a major mode of transmission. So you might have come across literature saying that the virus might survive on newspapers, it might survive on fruits, it might survive on shoes, it might survive on the floor or walls. But to implicate these, the floors or your shoes or your clothes or fruits or mobiles or newspapers with large scale transmission of the disease might not be right on the background of this kind of data or information which we have right now. We know that this is primarily a respiratory virus and even for influenza and other respiratory virus where fomites or the contaminated surfaces have known to be a mode of transmission, when we study them much deeply, the contribution of these fomites or external environment to the actual transmission of disease is limited or small. I am not negating or completely saying that there is no role but it is much, much less when you compare to the paranoid reaction we have in terms of disinfecting the equipments and shoes and you know, cloths and uh, fruits and mobiles, etc. So, based on this information, I would say that a rational infection prevention method for the public would consist of that as far as possible, we try to maintain social distancing because it is proven that droplets spread in close contact. So you can avoid crowded places when possible. Poor ventilation has been a source. So whenever you are indoors in a closed ventilation setting, it is a good idea to always wear masks. So masks would be the appropriate personal protective equipment for us to reduce the risk of acquiring this in a closed, poorly ventilated setting. When we are in public places and outdoors, when we touch the regular surfaces, we can pay attention to hand sanitization. The usual disinfectants are quite effective in destroying the coronavirus and hence regular cleaning of the environment should suffice with the, the routine disinfectants which we have been using to kill this virus in our environment. The World Health Organization has come forward and declared that there is no role for spraying disinfectants either into the environment like roads and houses and shops nor is there a role for spraying disinfectants onto people onto the surface of the people trying to clear the virus from their clothes, etc. So we need to focus on social distancing, avoiding crowds. We need to focus on using our masks appropriately to the setting and we need to focus on the hand hygiene. So this is in short what I would put forward as which is most important in transmission and so that we can live our lives a bit normally Unlike if we are paranoid about the whole environment being contaminated with the virus and we coming into touch with them and then acquiring this, etc. The second part is about there is a lot of again uh, information out there in WhatsApp which is masquerading as genuine medical information which claims a lot about the abnormal behavior of this disease and the disease manifestation being a kind of very unique situation which has never seen in the past or before not faced by the doctors. So while it is absolutely true that this is a new virus and we have no experience or exposure to this virus in the past, the way this virus has caused complications and the kind of complications this virus causes, meaning your severe pneumonia, your acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS requiring ventilation, the, uh, the, the propensity to cause clots or vascular thrombus, 
propensity to have bleedings, the multi-organ dysfunction syndromes. So all these kind of complications are well described with a lot of pathogens. These, most of the infectious diseases in the terminal stage or when they become very severe, they do progress to multi-organ dysfunction, they do progress to ARDS. So all these we have seen earlier with H1N1, we have seen earlier with the influenza. So what is different here obviously is in the scale of events. Obviously we have never seen so many ill people coming together at the same time to our hospitals. So that obviously is a different aspect of management. But so I, I would not consider the disease manifestations or the pathogenesis, etc., to be an absolutely unique uh, capability of this virus. And rather I would put it that this is a similar kind of complications which have been seen with multiple pathogens in the past, except that we, because of the number of people who have been infected together at the same time, we see a lot of sick people together and we see this difficult to manage when we have that kind of scale of events. If Again, if you look at the potential for a cure, whether we would have any uh, very potential active antiviral either for treatment of this viral infection, this COVID viral infection. So if going back, we had a lot of acute viral infections which had gone into, which causes death, which causes severe disease, starting from dengue, which has been endemic for decades in our country which still causes a lot of deaths. We have seasonal influenza and H1N1 influenza, which continue to cause deaths every year. For all these acute viral infections, compared to chronic viral, like HIV or hepatitis B or CME, our ability to develop a drug which would, like, a, like magic, cure a sick patient out has been very limited. So, right? so we, even though we have drugs for influenza, our ability to give a drug for influenza and cure a very sick patient from influenza ARDS just because of that antiviral drug has not actually happened. So I will be very skeptical about whether we have, we'll have a magic drug which, which we can cure sick people, very sick people, just by giving the drug and then all the pathogenesis, all the illness reverse, etc. Rather than that, what I would actually hope for is a drug which we can give in the earlier, the moderate phase of illness which might prevent the patients from going into multi-organ dysfunction and serious disease and hence we will have less number of sick people to treat and hence our ability to manage the disease would be much better. Similarly for vaccination, it would not be prudent on our part to expect a magic vaccine within three to six months which would be both effective and safe. So vaccine studies, both in terms of efficacy and safety, we need time to evaluate and understand. So definitely it will take months to years for us to come and use a vaccine on a such a large scale use and understand its efficacy and safety. So hence we need to go back and think about the transmission and preventing the transmission as the most important part if we don't want to end up with a lot of sick people ho happening into our hospitals and then having difficulty to manage. The uh, last uh, part of uh, the third perspective on this was whether uh, the the, the, the curative aspects, the, the ventilation and the modes of ventilation, so which is again in my perspective much similar to what we would treat with the general or the other infections which result in these kind of complications. The ICU management, why I am bringing up this here is that now unfortunately or fortunately a lot of medical literature is out there on the lay sphere, lay person sphere, talking about uh, that this kind of ventilatory management is wrong, this kind of ventilatory management is right, doctors are getting it wrong because they are treating cloths with oxygen, etc. So again, I just want to reiterate that second part that the ARDS and all are managed, they are, there are standard of cares to manage it and it is just because of the, the, the number of cases and the change in presentation that we, would, we might find it a bit difficult to manage these cases. Uh, now I would... Uh, take up some questions which was shared by our team earlier and so that uh, the some of these questions which might be important to you as lay people, I can give some uh, facts or some bit of an answers based on the available evidence for you. So our first question is, can we fight coronavirus by improving our immunity? So the, uh, so if you look at immunity, it is, it's like a double-edged sword. So. We have some of the complications of the disease itself is caused by immune dysregulation or your immunity acting up in a way it should not. So when we say that uh, neither do we have or neither do we have medicines or diet or etc which can which have been proven that will alter your immunity in such a way that it can resist the viral infection. 
nor do we know that boosting up the immunity in such a way will actually reduce the incidence of the disease or reduce its complications. So in short, right now we do not have neither medicines in, at least in modern medicine that can just boost up your immunity and prevent you from acquiring the virus, nor do we have any proof that if, if at all you change your immune system in such a way, this would actually prove beneficial for you in managing or controlling the disease complication. So the best thing right now for all of us is to focus on the general health in a way we have always done or we always know previously. So to stick to the normal diet and healthy diet based on whatever knowledge we have before, not saying that if you eat this, you can prevent corona, but focusing on overall general health as we have done before. Instead of undergoing radical diet changes and newer modalities into it, which we do not know whether it will work or even if it works, what way it will go. Uh, nextly, we would like to know, what are the effects of coronavirus on our body system? So, from lakhs and lakhs of cases which has been detected, what we know for sure is that 80-85% of them, they just have mild sort of illness. So, what do I mean mild? They might have a bit of viral fever like sort of syndrome, bit of a headache, mild body pain, some sore throat and it disappears over a couple of days and they are fine. Then for say 10 to 15 percent of the people actually this progresses to and develops what is called as a viral pneumonia. So they have uh, collections or inflammation in within their lungs and then it changes into pneumonia, they have difficulty breathing and then they need to be in the hospital. Now among this even much lesser percent, maybe between 1 to 5 percent, they develop a pneumonia so bad that they have to be admitted in the ICU because they need oxygen supplementation or may, maybe even ventilation to maintain the oxygen in their blood level. And among this a group, they develop what is called as multi-organ dysfunction where the immune system goes overboard and causes damage to multiple organs in your body like kidneys and heart, etc. So the, the virus at the initial stage can behave just like a mild, mild viral fever, goes on to develop at the stage of viral pneumonia and after that, there is a lot of immune system which comes into play and then you have bad pneumonia like syndrome like ARDS or other systems of your body are affected in that fashion. So this is how the viral behaves in your body. Okay, sir. So what are the treatment principles adopted in treating a COVID-19 patient? So uh, even though there is no uh, such thing as high level evidence for treating any of these components, either a mild disease or somebody with a pneumonia or somebody with a multi-organ dysfunction, as standard of care, meaning we don't have any drug or medicine which has say that this is the best and this has to be used. However, from the lot of studies which have been conducted all around and lot of clinical practice information, what we know that in the early phase, many of them do well with just supportive care, meaning you just manage their fever and cough, that's it, and you don't give any active medicines. Some of these people who are developing or into the pneumonia stage and all, there are antiviral drugs like lopinavir, ritonavir, rem remdesivir, there are immunomodulator drugs which changes your immune system plus who have additional antiviral property like hydroxychloroquine which have been used in that stage. Into the later stage when people are extremely sick then there are again drugs which could change the immune system or manage the immune hyperaction like tocilizumab and steroids etc which are again used in that phase. So we have multiple uh, interventions which have been studied which have been used in lot of people. But since this is new, all of us are waiting for a summary and analysis of all these use and so that we can say that yes, this is the right way of treating this disease. So as of now, these are the available options to us. Okay, sir. Uh, so how does the body system react after being infected by coronavirus? Will it infect the cured again? So uh, the response to an infection in, in re relation to whether we become immune to it, that is how you get a disease and after some time will you be immune to it is based on whether you have active or what is called as neutralizing antibodies against that. So it has been studied and established that yes, as human beings we do develop neutralizing antibodies to the coronavirus, which should give us immunity while those antibodies last in our body. So when I say that uh, once you acquire the disease, you are able to generate antibodies which are able to ward off the virus next time. That fact is known. What we still don't know is how long this will last. Okay, meaning will, will you continue to have this immunity lifelong or will it wane off after a couple of months? Will it wane off after a couple of years? So that part is not still well established. It might again take us time to understand that. But definitely 
once you develop the disease, you do develop immunity for some time. So the WHO had some time ago came up with a warning saying that just because somebody has got disease and they have got antibody, we should not assume that 100 percent that he is immune and then he can disregard the usual preventive measures. Okay, so this was uh, in terms of the healthcare workers again going to work, etc. So irrespective of whether you have got the disease or not, irrespective of whether you have the antibodies developed in your blood demonstrated or not, as of today, we, con we need to continue the preventive aspects and still uh, know, implement all the preventive aspects like the personal protective equipment, socialization, etc. even if you have got the disease. Okay, sir. So next question. Can coronavirus be spread through food, including restaurant takeouts, refrigerated, or frozen packed food? Yeah. So uh, what this is something which we also addressed in our initial introductory part that uh, the the, uh, the the amount of information we have about the virus being spread through such kind like food packets or restaurant or the frozen food is minimal or non-existent. So as of today, there is no reason for us to believe that the virus would be spread through food or food packets. Okay, so, so as I told you, we are primarily it is about the air and it is primarily about the immediate surfaces which we can come into contact and then contaminate ourselves. So instead of focusing again as a, again as following up on what I spoke in the introductory session, instead of focusing upon uh, disinfecting or looking at with suspicion everything we come into contact, we should focus on sanitizing our hands before we take them to our exposed things like eyes, mouth, etc. So that would be a better thing. And any soap and water, any routine disinfection process you do in, in your home, you need not have any special disinfections, etc. The normal thing works well. So you can continue to manage your home as you have always been. Okay, sir. So is it safe to get care for my other medical conditions during this time? So when there is lot of disease in the community and you reach a stage where <coughs> every person is a <coughs> sort of a suspect and hospital obviously is a place where a lot of ill people come. So hospitals will be a high risk area for acquiring the disease. So uh, this said and done, there is also obviously a strong need for us to manage our regular illness. So otherwise the, our regular illness may go for an imbalanced or for a toss and then it will cause complications and morbidities. So in that aspect, we should have a system. So it is not a question of whether it is safe. We should develop a system so that safe care of other illnesses are catered to. And that, that safety can be developed, can be implemented. So the hospitals have to put in certain measures to ensure that patients who come in do not acquire the disease from there. Similarly, each and every patient who comes to the hospital, they also have to put in measures that they don't transmit the disease to others. So the, there are a set of observations which is required for the hospital which I will not go into now but definitely for each and every person who goes into the hospital we need to remember that uh, it, on a purely elective or a planned basis it can be done. You can schedule your appointment so that there is no crowding in your waiting areas. You don't have to be with crowds. You should insist that you are provided with a mask or you can come with a mask so that you don't acquire it from the people around in the waiting areas or <clears throat> the other healthcare workers. You should ask for a hand sanitizer in the hospital and use it when you go there. So these are the things which we should take, we can take care from the patient perspective. Okay, sir. So how can we identify coronavirus and prevent spread from asymptomatic cases? So obviously if the patient is asymptomatic, we are, there, we are not going to see them in hospitals. We are not going to advise them tests. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways or why this virus has been very successful in transmission is just because of this, because it gets transmitted through mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic people who would not be uh, put into quarantine or isolation, etc. So right now, there is no way that with uh, no, be a screening questionnaire or a physical examination, we can identify these people who may transmit. So that is the reason the public measures like avoiding crowds and wearing masks are, should be universally applicable. Okay, right? Because we can never be certain that which person could be carrying and which person could not. So that is why this precautions about masks, this precautions about distances, this precaution about hand hygiene are universal across the board, irrespective of whichever scenario, whichever hospital or hotel or no, office you are. Okay. So how do antibodies combat coronavirus infection? So the antibodies are a mechanism by which our body generates the proteins necessary to neutralize or you know, kill the effect of the virus or cut down on the effect of the virus. And uh, though it, it is a complicated process which we need not sort of discuss in the lay public point of view, 
But what we need to understand is that the, the response of these antibodies in the initial phase, it takes a bit of time for it to raise in the blood and be detectable. And we have already spoken about the fact that in a good number of people, they do produce immunity which can prevent the disease in the short while. While we don't have enough information to say that whether these antibodies are sufficiently power to give immunity for a long time. Okay, sir. So comparing to Ebola, Spanish flu and SARS, how dangerous is coronavirus? Uh, if you look at it in terms of uh, numbers of people affected, then obviously uh, it, it is just a competition between the Spanish flu and the COVID because Ebola and SARS never reached this magnitude in terms of numbers. If you take in terms of the uh, death rate or mortality, that is the percentage of people who died from the disease, then Ebola is far, far ahead because between 50 to 70 percent or even beyond death was reported when people contracted Ebola. So that means 5 to 7 out of 10 people died if they acquired Ebola. Why for SARS it was just about 15 percent, 1 5. So about 1 to 2 people out of 10 died if they acquired SARS. While for this coronavirus it is far, far, far low. So we know that in situations where the healthcare systems were not crunched, we had enough beds, enough ICU beds, etc. to take care and where testing was adequate or in sufficient numbers. Mortality rates has been less than 1% in many of the countries. And even in the worst countries, and if you look at the global average still, it is between 2 to 5% that range. So obviously, even if you compare to SARS, the, the ability to kill or the mortality rate is much, much less. So is there a chance of COVID-19 second wave in India since now there are cases coming up in China again? So all the, if you look at the, the overall time of timeline of pandemics, so multiple waves are expected until we reach a stage of whether when we are either endemic, that means you have the disease continuously throughout the year in the community or we have what like what we mentioned seasonal variations like flu etc which comes and peaks during a certain phase. So with this kind of spread, we can expect that uh, it will be with us for some time. So either it will become slowly endemic and it will not cause so many deaths and all with a mild form it might remain or it might come back as seasonal flu and cause a peak in between in the year one or twice, twice, two times a year as the second or third wave, etc. So it is very likely. Okay, sir. Sir, at last we would like to know how do you, how do I know if COVID-19 or just a com common flu? So, so there is no particular clinical symptoms, etc., which can exactly differentiate between the two. But so this is very important to remember because uh, any common flu which masquerades as a common flu with just running nose or sore throat might turn out to be COVID. But if you put up in, uh, if you uh, look at the statistics statistically, then the the coronavirus infections are less likely to have running nose and rhinitis compared to the flu. Okay. And coronavirus patients are more likely to have absence of smell or anosmia or difficulty in appreciating smell compared to the flu. So the, other than this, there are not much of you know, very strong differentiating factors. And it's even said and done, these are also not 100% specific. So there is no way that just by history taking or looking at the symptoms or examination, we can say for sure that this is not corona and this is just a flu. But usually for corona, running nose is less and absence of smell is supposed to be more common with coronavirus. Thank you, Great sir. Thing.